Long time ago, when I was starting my MBA program, in my first semester, course called Introduction to Business Finance, I learned something which shocked me. And that learning was that the purpose of every business for profit is to maximize the wealth of shareholders. Maximize the wealth of shareholders. I was shocked. I said, there are few shareholders of any business, and all the people, all the employees, all the customers, all the suppliers, they all work to maximize the wealth of shareholders? Really? That didn't sit well in my mind, honestly. But reality remains the same. The only thing changed, companies become smarter. Instead of calling maximize the wealth of shareholder, they started to call shareholders value, which sounds much better. Fact remains the same. That is still true. And in those times, in the old business model, traditionally, to create shareholders value, which is basically profit, what you need to do, you need to find out products and services to sell typically products, inventory, warehouses, sales offices, things like that, to make some sales and make some profit out of it. And to do that, probably you have to invest money into the plant, factories, infrastructure, warehouses, things like that. And if you have to invest that much, the most important thing, you need capital, right? So that was the most critical part of the old business model. You needed capital. If you don't have capital, you couldn't start a business. If you have capital, you could start a good business. This model works very well until 60s and 70s, even in 80s. And this fits well with our accounting models. So I'm sure you know that the accounting model or the framework we follow is 500 years old. And that 500 year old system we are still using to support the modern businesses. And I'll show you what is changed in the modern businesses. If you look at the traditional accounting model, it fits very well. If you look at the balance sheet, we have place on the balance sheet for everything. Inventory, warehouses, plant, equipment, infrastructure, and capital, of course. And if you are able to invest wisely, you recover more than your investment, which increase the equity of the shareholders, and that is how you grow the business. As I said, this model works very well. What changed since 70s and 80s, and it started when Japanese started to invade the American market with automobiles and electronics. And at that time, the companies become much more conscious. Their goal remains to create shareholders' value, but they realize that probably a better way to create shareholders' value is to first create customer value rather than jumping on the shareholders' value. And today, as a matter of fact, most of the modern successful companies believe into it, so much so that they put customers as a stakeholder more important than shareholders, companies like Apple, Google. And these smart companies also realize that create customer value, what you need? You need a relationship with them, not only selling, but relationship. And how do you manage a relationship? Through branding. You become their friend. This is what not only the service companies, the tele telecommunication, insurance banks, but also the tangible products company like Apple do. They invest into the customer relationship. How do you do that? To do that, you need talented people, talented employees, very important. The most important resource or asset of a company, talented employee. If you have talented employee, of course, you can bring the right technology, you can create the right culture, and you can bring the right leadership to lead the company towards growth and profitability. That's a new business model. Now think of this, just compare this model with the previous model I showed you. And think from your accounting mindset, where do you fit, where our 500 years old accounting model fits into it? So of course we have the place for shareholders value. What about the customer's value? In our traditional accounting system, do we recognize that? Is there a place for customer's value? Is there a place for brand? Now we have some very conservative rules to value brand, but it's nothing. It's nothing. Relationship, we don't regard. We don't recognize. We are basically blind to all these things in the new business models, even including employees, technology, culture, leadership, we don't recognize in our traditional accounting system. There is no place for it. The only thing we recognize, shareholders value or profit. Now, this is the new business model which is being practiced very successfully by most of the most admired and successful companies in the world. So we, in terms, if you think that you are a supporting function, where are you supporting? The value creation process, we are not there. 
Now, of course, the smart CFOs understand that model. I'm not saying that we don't know this. But majority of the professionals are governed by the old mindset of accounting model, where we only see objectivity, tangibility. That is how we are trained for, right? When you are going through the professional accounting qualification for four to five years, you spend your time learning that what matters only is the materiality, is the objectivity, is the tangibility. We become blind to intangibles. We become blind to things like culture and brand and relationship and leadership, right? And that is how the most important resource in a business, talented employees, we write them off. We write them off as if they have no value. That's a dilemma we are encountering. If I continue to build my argument for the gap which is widening between the accounting model and the business model, I'll share with you some tangible factual information because our mind only does not accept ideas as an accounting professional. We only look hard evidence. Where is the hard evidence? Tell me. So here is the hard evidence. Apple, the most admired company for the last 10 years, founded in 1976, a new model, sales 143 billion, book value. So I'm assuming that all of you are familiar with this, what is a book value, I'm not going to explain that. Book value, $129 billion. Market value, $737 billion. Look at these two numbers. And this is a new phenomena. The gap between the book value and the market value is only increasing. The larger the gap, the more successful is the company. So if I ask you that what is that $600 billion we are not capturing on the balance sheet. The balance sheet, you only see $129 billion. This company has worth and value of $737 billion. We are not booking $600 billion on the balance sheet. What does that represent? What is the most important asset of Apple? It's people, it's brand, right? So $600 billion, which we are not able to capture in the financial system, represents the value of the company in terms of relationship, customer's equity, customer value, brand, relationship, employee talent, leadership, culture, et cetera, et cetera. Google, another very successful company founded in 1998, 82 billion in sales, 128 billion in book value on the balance sheet. Market value, $533 billion. Now, Google is basically an internet company. Basically, now they are into getting into the hardware that they acquired Motorola in 2012, but it still remains basically an internet company. 400 billion difference in the book value and market. What does that represent? Actually, the 533 billion market cap is more than the market capital of the companies like General Electric. General Electric is somewhere like $285 billion, and Google is $533 billion. And this value is a hard fact. It's evidence, it's the real value investors are willing to put on this company, $533 billion. As a matter of fact, $533 billion is also more than the combined value of General Motors, Boeing, and Ford together. Think of this. Gigantic industrial companies, and Google has more value than that. So question again, what is that? Answer remains the same. It's all the intangibles, the brand, the people, the culture, the leadership, the technology. Google is very proud of its culture. That's their competitive advantage. Because you cannot copy that culture in the short term. So this becomes their competitive advantage. Amazon, another amazing company, founded in 1994, 121 billion in sales. Book value, 17 billion. Market value, 398 billion. Look at the gap. Almost 23 times book market ratio. This was unknown for, for a long period of time in the history of corporate, but today is becoming very visible and noticeable. Now, Amazon is even not much profitable. It hardly runs on very low margins. Why the investors are putting such a high value on the company? Again, this is related to the people, the culture, the brand, and it's a future promise of the company. It's not about the current profitability. It's a future promise. These companies I'm showing you are investing a lot into the customer value for future. And investors are smart, shareholders are smart. They are not in a hurry as long as they see future value. Now, first of all, they are getting returns in terms of their market value, of course. They could sell their stake at a high value. They are happy. But even with a long-term investment commitment, it's a good scenario for them because ultimately this value would realize into their profits. 
So you could argue that these are the high-tech companies, new model, very different. But let's talk about some old business model, Starbucks. It's not a high-tech company. Founded in 1971, sales $21 billion. Six billion book value, market value $78 billion. Again, a ratio of book to market 13 times, very high. Brand is the brand for which you pay double the price of a normal coffee. I share you a personally interesting fact. I don't like Starbucks coffee flavor, personally. I like more McDonald's coffee, which is very cheap, $1. Starbucks is $3 something. So as long as I need to drink coffee alone, I don't mind drinking McDonald's for $1 because it's a good price, good coffee. But if I'm with my executive colleagues, I'm shy enough not to go to the McDonald's. I will go to Starbucks, and even I don't like, I would rather pay three times the price and buy Starbucks. That's the power of a brand. It's the part of lifestyle, right? We use Apple products not for the functionality only. We use those products and pay a high price because of the lifestyle. That's a brand value. That value is reflected in the market value. That's investors are smart, shrewd. They know it. A Starbucks could make a lot more money with the same level of coffee. Another few one example, General Electric, our favorite company, very old, more than 100 years, 1892. Sales 122 billion, uh, book value 85 billion, market value 261 billion. It's still a big difference, right? Again, the same thing, all the intangibles. So if I try to explain you the value creation process of this new business model. So again, it's not about the profitability. Now, we are all accountants basically, and based on the traditional accounting system, we only think in tangible terms. Show me the profit. Show me where is the real value in terms of money. We don't recognize intangibles, customer value. So the new business model is like that. Still, it's about shareholders' value, very true. But as I said, smart companies believe that it's a customer value which would help to maximize the shareholder value much easier. And how do you create customer value? It's the talented employees. You bring the right people into the company, which is proven by Apple and Google and all those amazing companies, and they are enabled. So you need to bring technology and systems to enable talented employees and bring, create the right culture and leadership to create, to help them create customer value. So again, in the whole game of value creation, it is the employee, talented employee, who is a very critical resource, who is driving customer value. So think of this flow of value creation again, and think from your accounting mindset. Where do you see? Where do we fit into this? So we don't recognize employees as an asset or resource. We don't recognize leadership or culture. We hardly recognize any systems and technology investment. We don't know what customer value is. We only come into the picture from accounting when it created to shareholders' value, right? Well, for the business people who are working very hard, to create value, it's the end of the game. When the value, customer value, is being converted into shareholders' value, which happens at the time of revenue recognition, it's the end of the value creation cycle for them. And we only start our process at that time because we are blind. From a traditional accounting system, we are blind to see all the value creation process before that, right? That's the dilemma we are talking about. And only business people could tell you that how much support they need on the value creation part. So how does the customer, or what is the customer value? Customer value is customer happiness, customer delight. I mean, those of you, uh, how many of you use Gmail from Google? Raise your hands. And of course, you also use Google Calendar probably. You also knows, use Google Maps and other services, and they're all completely free. Now, as a matter of fact, Google has, on the Gmail users, more than one billion active users on Gmail. More than one billion active users for Gmail users. I'm sure if the company imposed a price on use of the Google services, people wouldn't mind paying $5 or $10 a month because there is already a value. So imagine, think of this. If Google started to charge a price of $10 a month for one billion active users, they would immediately create a profit of $10 billion a month, $10 billion a month, right away profit. 
equivalent to $120 billion in a year profit, more than their sales. Why are they not able to do it? Are they stupid people? They are very smart people. The value, market value of 533 billion reflects that. The loyalty of the customer, the value creation of the customers, as I said, one, million, one billion people are happy customers of Google. And Google is not in a hurry to make money. They want to invest in the customer value and keep it for long term, for better opportunities. Same goes for Apple, same goes for other amazing companies. Think of the Microsoft Skype. How many of you use Skype? Raise your hands. Free, right? There are more than 100 million users of using Skype. Don't pay anything. If they start charging a money, would you pay? Of course, people will pay some money. They could immediately convert that functionality of Skype into profit, but they're not doing it. Are they stupid? Of course not. They're very smart people. They are investing in the customer value. These services like Google, Gmail, or Skype requires a lot of resources and investment. And it's part of the business running. We are not part of it, finance people. Because it's not a profitable activity. We only book the cost, charge the cost, and that goes into the PL. But they are focused on the long-term value creation. So it's not about profitability maximization in the new business model. It's about value creation. Now, unfortunately, that concept has not been digested well by the finance world, finance and accounting world. So you see, all these customer value ultimately translates into shareholders' value. Let's talk about employees' value, because we said employees are also the most important resource of the company. What is employee value? Loyalty, retention, engagement, learning and growth, all those ultimately translate into shareholders' value, right? So these are long-term investments. Why are we not recognizing into the finance and accounting systems? This is the gap only widening between the finance and accounting domain and the business domain. So if we have to really come out based on this new business model and understanding, what should be the role of finance beyond the traditional bookkeeping or record keeping function? It should be related to the value creation. So first of all, finance function should be really in a position to help maximize value creation. Now, I think you understand the value creation is not about profit only, it's a much broader concept. Simply by creating customer happiness, you create customer value, which is non-monetary, by the way. It's intangible, but that is what the companies are doing. So role of the finance should be, first of all, measuring the value created. How are we doing here? Only partly. Because if you say the profit is also part of the value creation, yeah, we do that, but that's it. We are blind to the intangibles, which create value. What about understanding what drives value? Do we have that level of insight into the business? Not really. Most of the time, we are confined within the walls of finance and accounting, and not involved much into the business. And thirdly, finally, minimizing the leakage of value. This is about the controls. So we only talk about the financial controls, but what about the controls related to the intangibles and the uh, value creation resources and activities? So if you take that scenario, which is, by the way, it's not future, it's today. All these companies are running these business models today, and as I said, there are, of course, a lot of smart people within finance and accounting who are supporting this business model, but we have failed to bring a tangible accounting model to support these business models. That's a dilemma. Now, I don't have a solution, honestly, myself, but for me, a problem well-defined is half solved. Do we understand this problem? And if you understand that problem, at least you can find out something, which the smart finance people and CFOs are doing for these companies. So first of all, you could blame your traditional educational system. That even today, we are producing bulk of accountants and accountants and accountants, all the accounting bodies with due respect. That's what we are doing. We are not creating business managers. Now, no doubt, we need a lot of accountants in the beginning of the, their careers, but then we need senior level business finance people, and we don't have any structure for that. A smart CFOs become CFOs because of their smartness or their own proactive interest in the growth and development. We don't have any structure. Or you can blame yourself. You don't have time for that. Well, whatever is the reality, these are the two hardcore facts, that if you don't do something, it will be a little late in the game. So before that happens, it's the time for us to wake up. So mainly the challenges faced by typically most of the professionals is number one, time constraint. We don't have time. We are burning in our job day in and day out. 
and that results in lack of, we think we are productive by working long hours, actually that is lack of productivity. We become less efficient, less productive by putting more hours. And then work-life balance, we are, we are burning our lives into it. Second thing is image problem. Non-finance people or business people still don't hesitate to call us bookkeeper, accountants, even bean counters. Is that not true? Because some people are really a reflection of that bean counters. Why do we need to build up our image is basically to communicate with non-finance people in the business language to develop our relationship. Because if you really want to be the partner in the value creation process of the business, you need to involve. You cannot manage or support that process sitting in the walls of accounting and finance department. It's not possible. First of all, you need to understand business, learn strategy, and then work with the business people. And how do you work? You communicate with them. You develop a relationship. You become interactive. That is how you do it. So as I said that Mecca is not only a networking platform. We started as a networking platform in our limited capacity. Now there are 15,000 professionals. And in our limited capacity, we tried to do whatever we could do to support the profession, actually, and help the finance professionals. So two years ago, I, in the capacity of the founder of Mecca, did a survey. And uh, the result of that survey, I think 200 to 300 people responded. What is the biggest question in their mind? And the biggest question in their mind from their career point of view was, what it takes to become a CFO? And we deliberated on that question to help them. And basically, then we came out this framework, leadership framework, to become a CFO. That, you look, you probably know enough of accounting and IFRS. You don't need to learn. Most of them or all of them are professionally qualified accountant. What you need to learn is the leadership and a strategy. And to learn leadership, you need to really go a little deep into it. Because as I said, leadership you cannot do sitting in your office or in your cubicle. Leadership is talking to the people leading the people. So for that, you need to learn emotional intelligence. You need to work on your brand. Peter Drucker, long time ago, said that the function of every business, there are only two functions for every business. Number one, innovation. Number two, marketing. That's it. He said this for businesses. I would say this is very much true for each professional today. You have only two focus, should be two focus. Innovation and marketing. Innovation, developing yourself, learning, because without learning, you would fail very quickly. You would become obsolete very soon. And number two, marketing. Marketing is inevitable. Think of yourself as an entrepreneur. We are all entrepreneurs, actually. We are, in the, we are entrepreneur in the business of selling our talent. If you don't market your talent, you would fail. Someone else would sell the, their talent, and you, would, you, would, you have to be comparative. So personal branding is an inevitable function, or whether you like it or not. Every one of us have a personal brand, so why not better, better work on it and make it as we want it? Then on the public leadership side is communication, leadership, relationship, service, and a strategy. Now, many people misunderstand strategy. They're saying it's simple enough, I already know it enough working in a company. No, it's a very deep subject and it's growing and becoming more and more, more and more complicated. A strategy is not about a strategy, it's about a strategic mind. You need to be, develop your strategic thinking. So these are the three areas, in my opinion. A strategic mindset or strategic thinking, then performance management. It's no more about financial management. There is no financial management. The new business models are fully integrated. You cannot run financial management in isolation. As I said, that when you create customer value, ultimately translate into shareholders value, it's one process. There are no two separate processes. So you need to focus on performance management and finally value creation, not profit maximization, value creation. So this is the model we, we introduced to the community. And I personally introduced a CFO coaching program, which went very well, by the way. We have trained more than 100 people on this model very successfully, and it's still going very well. But I realized that there is one part missing. And one part missing is the life, work-life balance. because. Typically, wherever you see people are burning out in their finance jobs, especially the mid-career mid and the senior level of jobs. So what do we need to do? Uh, that answers, that questions left me to believe that it's about work-life integration, not work-life balance. There is no work-life balance. The people who are trying to manage work-life balance, they live, they live in compartments. Nine to five, this is my work life, then my private life. No, you have one life, it's very limited better integrated. 
better integrate. I, all of my career, I did not mind to do small work, personal work at my work, in my office, but at the same time, there was hardly any weekend I didn't do any corporate work at my home. That is how I integrated my life. I was always comfortable. It's only a matter of priorities, not compartments. So we added that part into that program, and now we have a new program, which is called the Mecca CFO Mastermind Program. And there is some information on your tables if you're interested to go look into deep. And uh, we also, so first batch, first group, there are 14 senior finance professionals. Eight of them are CFOs, and the remainder are the senior level, senior controllers or directors. And we are going through that leadership development process. Now, the goal is really to create finance leaders of future. We are, because they, as I said, they know enough of accounting. In fact, they need to unlearn some of the accounting and become better business leaders. So our goal is that end of the day, they become not only better business leaders, but with good financial background. And with that combination of a good financial background with a lot of business insight and leadership, they become better business manager, better than their business counterparts. That's our goal is. And that's what actually should happen within the finance profession. So as I said, in Mecca, in our limited capacity, we have started that process. I'm sharing with you because you could do on your own that process. We need to realize that the time is running very fast, the change is coming very fast, and if we don't do something, then it would be too late for all of us individually and collectively, and from the corporate point of view, the companies you serve for. So what you could do, this is what a wise man 200 years ago said. What really matters today is your ability to change, adaptability, adapt how quickly you could change. Now, I'm doing corporate trainings for 20 years. I know how this process works. The traditional trainings are not working anymore. First of all, it's very hard to find one day, even one day, out of your work to go to a training. And if you're able to find that time for one day, two day, three day workshop, you go there, you learn, gain some knowledge, you are excited, and one week, two weeks after, you are back to where you started. That doesn't work. That is why we started this new structure of the online coaching. In online coaching, we do paced learning for 12 weeks. So first of all, you don't have to get out of your work. You can do weekend from your uh, comfort of your home for two hours, and that, that is how you become more receptive of the information. And the Mecca Mastermind, we created almost a one-year program because the idea is that remaining the program, before you finish it, you must deploy what you want to apply in your life. So it's all about uh, practical insights, changing your lifestyle. Here is my little two cents. If you really want to take the first step, if you believe what I have shared with you, that this is the time to change, start small, take baby steps. These are the two wonderful books. Easy read, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. How many people have read it? Raise your hands. Okay. This is the book. If you have to read one book on business or leadership, this is the one. So better, as a finance, senior finance professional, better buy a copy and start reading it whenever you have time. The other, if you want to start in the domain of strategy, this is a good starting book. It's very small read, by the way, less than 200 pages, very simple language. Start with this strategy book. And once you start getting insight from these two books, that would motivate you to go further. And that's all we need.